The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Uh, we're just going to hang on a couple more minutes while more folks log in. Um, so sit tight, and we'll be back in a moment. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar about forest carbon and co-benefits. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Melissa Gallant, and I'm an associate with Forest Trends Ecosystem Marketplace. Today, I'll be starting off the conversation talking about findings from our recent forest carbon finance report. Then we'll be hearing from Helena Barona with the MBO Scalelte Forest Carbon Project in Chiapas, Mexico. Then we'll have Owen Hewlett and Giancarlo Ratio with the Gold Standard, which is a carbon standard organization that's been packaging credits related to the Sustainable Development Goals. And finally, we'll hear from Ben Henneke with the International Small Group Tree Planting Program, which promotes tree planting and sustainable agriculture with farmers in East Africa and South Asia. Before we jump in, just a note on logistics, uh, please ask your questions through the question box on your screen. Um, and for anyone who has to jump off early or has coworkers who couldn't attend, we will be recording today's webinar and posting it on Ecosystem Marketplace's website within the next couple of days. Before we begin, I'd also like to recognize all of our sponsors and supporters at Ecosystem Marketplace. It's thanks to their generous support that we can host these webinars and make all our reports freely available. So for those of you who might be unfamiliar, Ecosystem Marketplace is an initiative of the nonprofit Forest Trends based in Washington, D.C. We produce reports and articles covering the latest trends in ecosystem markets and conservation finance worldwide. And a couple of our recent reports that I'd like to draw your attention to. Uh, first of all, most of my presentation today will focus on findings from the uh, 2017 State of Forest Carbon Finance Report. Next, we have the State of Voluntary Carbon Markets Report, which I'll be drawing on as well. Not So Niche is a report that came out in 2016 and dives into the co-benefits associated with forest carbon projects specifically. And finally, this is a screenshot of our forest carbon portal. Uh, we have a database of environmental projects environmental markets projects worldwide um, and our interactive maps are currently in the process of getting a facelift and we'll be launching our new project portal within the next few months. So before we get too deep into co-benefits, let's just take a quick step back and look at where are forest and land use projects located. This map shows a number of projects worldwide. It includes forestry projects like improve forest management or avoid defo avoided deforestation, as well as other kinds of land use projects like grassland management or soil carbon. As you can see here in the map, New Zealand, Australia, the US and the UK have the greatest number of projects. All of these countries also have some form of government run carbon market that includes offsets from forestry and land use projects. But there are also many projects in Latin America, Africa and Asia one thing to keep in mind here is that these circles represent the number, not the size of these projects. And some countries like Brazil and Indonesia have several large projects that produce a disproportionately high number of offsets. So this map is based on information from carbon registries and program websites, whereas the information in our State of the Forest Carbon Finance report 
uh, came from a survey that we did of forest carbon project developers, as well as retailers and brokers that resell carbon offsets. And not all of the projects on that map responded to our survey. So in 2017, our report included co-benefits information about 148 projects. These projects were associated with a total of almost 9 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents transacted in 2016. They represent an area of 12.2 million hectares, which is over 47,000 square miles and is almost the size of the country of Honduras. All but four of these projects sell offsets on the voluntary market where buyers and sellers are not required by any government regulation to participate. So this map is based on our survey results and it shows the volume of offsets transacted from each country. As you can see here, the biggest producers of offsets sold on the voluntary carbon market were Brazil, Peru, the US and Indonesia. By region, Latin America and the Caribbean was the largest with 5.2 million offsets transacted, followed by Africa and Asia. So this map gives us a sense of the market size in terms of, of uh, the market tran uh, offsets transacted, excuse me, but it doesn't get into any of the additional benefits that forest and land use projects often bring to nearby communities and ecosystems. Which brings us to co-benefits. So many project developers and buyers have told us that these non-carbon benefits are one of the main reasons that they participate in the market. And we categorize co-benefits into six interrelated categories, jobs and training, community benefits, biodiversity, water, climate adaptation, and land tenure. On uh, just a quick shout out, all of these pictures came from uh, projects that reported to our survey. So our survey results found that almost all projects reported contributing to at least one of these co-benefit areas with a third of projects reporting over three. Of these, employment and training was the most common with 147 projects reporting that they employed or trained people in local communities. Uh, these projects were associated with 8.6 million offsets and 12.2 million hectares. They reported employing almost 8,000 people, 58% of whom were women. They also trained their employees and community members in everything from carbon accounting and sustainable agriculture methods to business skills. About half of projects reported benefiting local communities, especially traditionally disadvantaged groups. As you can see, there are many ways that projects can benefit communities, and I think some of our panelists will get into some more specific examples. But a few of the things that projects reported to us were economic benefits, both through direct income, like employment and sharing revenue from carbon offset sales, as well as indirect income, like supporting other local industries. Some projects also invested in things like community health clinics or local schools, and many agroforestry projects also enhanced food security by helping to boost yields and diversify crops. Of course, when you're talking about forestry and land use, it's hard not to think about biodiversity. And almost half of all projects reported benefiting biodiversity with many protecting areas that have threatened and endangered species. 44 of the 70 projects reported protecting at least one designated high conservation value area. 44 projects also reported having water related benefits. Some protected key watershed areas or restored ecosystems along rivers and streams, which improves water quality and helps prevent flooding. And others helped provide access to clean drinking water. Climate adaptation is another area that a lot of projects had an impact. We had 40 projects reporting that they somehow improved adaptation to climate change, some through protecting habitat areas of species threatened by climate change, others from enhancing food security, and some from making communities more resilient to natural disasters like storms and forest fires. Finally, 24 projects helped to clarify land tenure in their project areas. Now, this isn't a challenge that every project faces, but in some places, communities lack clear government recognized ownership of the land that they live on and the resources that are associated with it. Clarifying those rights, in addition to allowing the carbon project to proceed, can also encourage other kinds of long term investment in sustainable land management. 
So one question that all of this raises, especially in the minds of project developers, is how do co-benefits influence offset buyers' decision making? So one of the questions that we ask in our survey is, what are buyers' main concerns when choosing which offsets to buy? And this figure shows those answers broken out by the volume of offsets purchased. As you can see, co-benefits, which is in blue in both of these, in these charts, was the primary concern for almost three quarters of the offsets that were sold from forest and land use projects. Whereas for the overall voluntary carbon market, other concerns like cost and the fit with the organization's mission were more common. Community benefits and biodiversity were listed as the two most influential of the co-benefits categories. That said, there is mixed evidence as to whether or not co-benefits actually bring up the price. For example, in 2016, we saw that the average price of offsets sold from verified carbon standards certified projects was actually slightly higher than offsets from projects that had both BCS and the co-benefit add-on climate community and biodiversity standard. At the same time, forest and land use projects which tend to have greater co-benefits than other project types, sold at higher, project, higher prices than most other project types on the voluntary carbon market. So how do you measure co-benefits? Um, it's not as straightforward as measuring carbon. Um, carbon standards began with the intention of measuring and verifying the amount of carbon that projects either prevented from being emitted or removed from the atmosphere but as the market has evolved, co-benefits have been integrated into many carbon standards. Some carbon standard organizations have separate standards for carbon offsets and co-benefits, while others have integrated co-benefits into their carbon standard. In 2016, we found that 78% of forestry and land use offsets transacted on the voluntary carbon market came from projects that either had a co-benefits add-on certification or a standard that incorporated co-benefits. Finally, before I hand it off to our panelists, I wanted to touch on another somewhat recent development in forest carbon co-benefits, which is linking co-benefits with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. As I'm sure many of you know, the SDGs are a set of 17 goals that the UN announced in 2015, a couple months before the Paris Agreement was negotiated. They essentially present an overarching vision for how to improve the world in the next 15 years. And as you can see on the slide here, they include everything from investing in infrastructure to advancing gender equality. Forest carbon is most directly related to goal 13, which is climate action, and goal 15, which is life on land. But depending on the project and the co-benefits that it achieves, forest carbon could easily be linked with most, if not all, of the goals. Many standards and projects have made an effort to link their project's accomplishments with the SDGs and there are many targets and indicators, and that's something that we'll also be hearing more about today. Thank you very much. And with that, I'd like to pass it on to our first panelist, Helena Barona from the Scolelte Forest Project in Chiapas, Mexico. Thank you, Kelly. Um, uh, thank you, everybody that are online and following us on this panel. And my, the other panelists, thank you for joining us for this um, this webinar. Okay, I'm going to talk about escolte. Escolte uh, means uh, the tree that grows in Celtal. is one of the indigenous groups that we have in Chiapas, Mexico, where we are located, and we are working on the, the standard plan vivo. So, can we have the next one? The next slide. Slide. Okay. Why do we work in forests? Uh, the importance of having terrestrial ec ecosystems are that they help to regulate climate, uh, they help to keep watersheds, uh, watersheds and soil stability, and they increase biodiversity. Uh, according to SDG 15, if we uh, continue doing what we're doing with the forest uh, around 100, uh, 1,600 1, million people depend on this kind of habitats, talking about animals, human beings, plants, insects, all kind of biodiversity, 80% of the terrestrial species. Uh, according to SDG 2, uh, 15, 
if we keep doing what we're doing, uh, 13 million hectares of forests are going to be lost every year. And at this rate, 74% of the world's poor population will be affected with this. Uh, talking about forests, uh, this, uh, this uh, give you uh, ecosystem services such as carbon sequestration, water purification, protection to biodiversity, prevention of natural disasters, pollination, uh, recreation activities, and food security. Can we have the next one, please? Okay, uh, Plan Vivo is a standard that works with the smallholders. Uh, this is very particular because uh, the smallholders uh, that we have uh, to, that are participating with Plan Vivo uh, usually have uh, small land uh, portions. This is important for us because usually they don't participate in any other productive incentives because of the amount of land that they have. So we work directly with uh, these small holders that usually are um, not receiving any kind of uh, benefit from any other organizations because of that, because they don't have uh, great amounts of land. So what do we do with the SDGs? We have a direct impact in poverty, no poverty. Uh, we have short-term income increases we are building, building a human and natural capital, and we have contribution to local livelihoods. In Zero Hunger, for example, we work with different agroforestry systems, and we increase soil fertility and agricultural production. Uh, we have a different type of tree species. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in, in this particular forest quality. Uh, also, we work with uh, SDG 8, 13, as you said, Kelly, 15, and a partnership, 17. In this case, uh, for 17, we work with a lot, a lot of other entities like government or other NGOs. So we help to create a partnership and we are linking other incentives and other co-benefits to these smallholders that usually don't have any contact with any of these other organizations. Uh, something that is very important for us, for us is that we have a third party validation and verification. So we try to ensure that our carbon models are very robust and conservative on how we are measuring uh, the carbon sequestration. Next, please. Okay. Well, what is Escolete? Escolete, as I said, uh, it is a carbon sequestration uh, project that works with ecosystem services and also works with reforestation and forest management activities that provide social and environmental co-benefits. Um, We've been working uh, for the voluntary market for almost 20 years. We are kind of the first experiences in carbon sequestration around the world. Uh, we work with 97 communities from Chiapas, Mexico. We have uh, 1,282 smallholders. And we also work with seven agroforestry agro systems. Uh, we are using two types of climates here. We work with tropical and template climates uh, for our technical specifications. We also work with four indigenous groups. These are Choles, Tojolavales, Celtales, and Tzotziles. Uh, talking about payments to smallholders, we uh, have until 2016 uh, around $600,000 uh, already paid. And talking about forest management, we are working with around 9,000 uh, hectares of uh, territory here in Chiapas. And also talking about certificates issue, we already have 518,631 518, um, CO2 certificates issued. Next, please. But what is the context of Chiapas? Chiapas? Chiapas is the southern state of Mexico. It is a very rich state talking about biodiversity, but it also has um, the highest standard of poor people in Chiapas. 
Uh, for example, Chiapas is the largest producer of coffee in Mexico, uh, talking about uh, the production of uh, the coffee beans, and is the ninth exporter of coffee beans in around the world, but also uh, has 77% of its population living under poverty. Uh, the main productive activity here in Chiapas is the agricultural sector, but we talk about local farming and small-scale livestock. And also Chiapas is one of the richest states uh, for biodiversity, talking about terrestrial and coastal ecosystems, but also is losing a lot of fortune of uh, forests every year through fires, deforestation, degradation, and climate change activities, also as natural disasters. Can we have the next one, please? This is the area of work of uh, Escolete. As you see, uh, everything that is going through yellow is the uh, municipalities in which we work. Uh, these 97 communities are around these municipalities. And all the area that you see in green are natural protected areas. So we work uh, very close to natural protected areas or inside natural protected areas. So this uh, helps them to amortize uh, all the degradation and the fires and all these um, uh, activities that are producing to lose the forest around these, uh, these areas. Can we have the next one, please? Okay, these are the co-benefits that we already um, have uh, a study in Escolete of how we are getting an impact in, the, in terms of co-benefits. And one of the most important co-benefits that we have is that we are straining capacities and rescuing traditional knowledge. We do a lot of work shopping uh, with, with the smallholders like the first approach that we have is we talk about uh, climate change, how this is affecting um, around the world, how this can affect their own lands and their own livelihoods. So they have uh, all this approach uh, on how they can have a sustainable way of uh, living inside a forest. And this also comes with a productive incentive on how they can um, leave from the forest. For example, in this case, we're working with um, tradition, tra traditional knowledge in how to use medicinal plants. They have a lot of plants that can have a medic medicinal use in uh, their own places. Uh, many of these communities do not have health services, so this helps them uh, to improve their health in their own communities. They, we're also helping them to develop uh, the cultivation of mushrooms uh, for uh, to food security or to sell them in the local market. And they are, use, they are also using organic agriculture. Another topic that is very important for us, we have people that have been in the program uh, since 1998, for example, some of our technicians have already almost 20 years working with us. So they, we are straining uh, local governance and leadership capab capabilities in their own communities because from what they learn, they have become uh, leaders in their own communities. Uh, talking about the inclusion of women in productive processes, this is something that we are working very hard right now. Uh, we have an entire coordination that is working with gender perspective and we do a lot of uh, workshop too to help them integrate in all the processes of uh, Escol el Té and from, from planting, from uh, monitoring, from all the processes that we do with, a, with the project. Uh, we have work groups uh, for handcrafts. They, they are already selling handcrafts, honey, chocolate, and medicinal plants. These are all um, productive activities that are already being uh, sell in a local market. We also promote uh, biodiversity, as I said, uh, by working in close to or inside 
five natural protected areas. Uh, we talk about in integral management of the territory by designing the plan vivos and by uh, doing a sustainable uh, management of the natural resources. We also do a lot of partnership with local and regional actors and international actors too. Right now, we have uh, complementary projects that we work with IUCN, uh, with uh, United Nations and with Conservation International, uh, among other uh, governmental uh, institutions like CONAFOR. And we are linking them so these uh, communities have uh, another spectrum of activities that they can uh, help them improve their, their own communities and their own capabilities. Uh, talking about uh, mitigation and training awareness, uh, as I said before, we do a lot of uh, training on how climate change is impacting and we also uh, work uh, by rescuing 28 local species of trees. Uh, 12 of them are in danger. They are uh, located in the IUCN red list. So we are uh, restoring with this, uh, this kind of species. We also generate uh, revenues by uh, uh, employing uh, or generating uh, direct uh, works uh, and permanent works and seasonal works uh, for the monitoring periods. And we have located that the smallholders are employing these uh, revenues in health, children's education, food and productive activities. We are also working to create a uh, force safeguards as part of one of the complementary projects. And we are restraining uh, all the community's organization capabilities. Can we have the next one, please? Okay, as you said, Kelly, it is complicated to measure co benefits. Uh, some of them are very clear as, as carbon sequestration. Other ones uh, need to have a lot of uh, quality work, uh, political work. So uh, we're working right now in creating uh, new indicators. Uh, actually, right now we have a technical specifications. Uh, we updated uh, these specifications and we are working right now with a software called Shamba. Uh, so we are adapting our all uh, technical specifications to this software. And we are also, uh, as I said, uh, working with seven agroforestry systems, uh, both tropical and template. And we are also gathering all our information to a database that is called, um, that is in a software called Access. Uh, we had a lot of information in paper. Uh, we are a very old project. Uh, we have a very amount, a, a large amount of, of data that we needed to put it in, in um, a technical uh, base. Uh, well, in a, and, and now we are working uh, to put everything in in computers and put it in numbers and put it in uh, general all the general information that we have it we have uh, to update as uh, as we're doing right now. Uh, in the case of the indicators, uh, we are planning to um, get information about the involvement of the community uh, in terms of governance, adaptation to climate change, water biodiversity, generation of jobs. Uh, benefits of vulnerable groups and women, direct benefits to generate sales uh, that generate from the sales of carbon, indirect uh, benefits of management and participation. And uh, we're, we're planning to do this survey this year. Uh, this uh, survey is going to be made by the community and regional technicians and is going to have a verification by ambient technicians. Some of the, this information, we already have it. We, we are kind of putting everything together and doing double check uh, so we can publish everything once we have all the information. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay. These are some examples of uh, people that already participated in Escolete. I want to give uh, some examples of how they are doing after uh, Escolete. Uh, this is uh, one example in a template uh, condition of climate. This is the community of Siscal. They participated in Escolete 15 years ago. They are located 
in a natural park uh, called Montebello Lakes. There is a system like around uh, seven uh, lakes that are in this natural park. This is uh, the biggest one, and they live uh, near the, the, the lake. They have two coffee cooperatives conferred by my smallholders, and one of these cooperatives is uh, run only by women. Uh, this community has an agreement, and they decided that the, all the trees that they planted with Escolte and the ones that were already there, they were going to stay there. They are not using any of these trees for timber, uh, so they are using uh, these trees uh, for coffee plots improvement. They, they are having uh, good improvement on the coffee production by shades, and they decided to go for ecotourism activities. They received a government support uh, some years ago for the construction of cabins, and they are having a lot of diffusion of uh, media by um, uh, this help of the, of the government. So they have a lot of visits from tourists to the area. So they are doing very well. That's the link to their uh, website. And this is, a, this is a good example of how they are uh, improving their lives by keeping the forest. Uh, the next slide, please. This is another region of work that we had. Uh, this is uh, the region of uh, Chilon. We have uh, 13 communities that participated 20 years ago with Escolte. They use, <coughs> I'm sorry, improved agroforestry systems to produce coffee and cacao. Uh, these agroforestry systems uh, are produced naturally. Uh, and well, these agroforestry produce naturally two types of palms. Uh, one is called chapaya, the other is called chip. And they are very demanded in the local uh, market for food purposes, especially chapaya, and they are very well paid. They usually sell uh, these palms in the northern, northern uh, region of Chiapas, uh, in a place called Palenque. And they introduce another uh, kind of palm that they export uh, for floral purposes uh, that is called camedora. And they are doing very well by producing these uh, palm trees. Next, please. And we're running a little bit short on time, Helena, so if you don't mind, um, keep keep the next okay, couple. Uh, talking Thank about, you. yeah, sure. Talking about women, uh, we work with 27 communities. As I said before, they are doing uh, productive activities and they, are, uh, they have already experience in a uh, local market by selling their products and farmer's market. Um, the next one, please. Um, this is our network of technicians. We have young people and old people working for uh, uh, Escolete. Uh, the, these uh, technicians uh, have experience in recollecting seats. Uh, they are trainers. They, are, uh, they have uh, um, uh, knowledge in carbon monitoring using GPS and nurseries and management and forest inventories. Uh, the girl that we have right in the left is one of our youngest technicians, and uh, she's a very good uh, at monitoring. So I can wrap it up with this. These were some examples on how, how they are improving their capacities by uh, participating with Escolete. And if you have any other question, we can talk about that later. Thank you. You, Helena. Um, I think it's always great to hear about uh, real on the ground things that are going on. Um, so it's great to hear what you're up to there in Chiapas. Uh, and with that, I'll Thank pass you. it off to uh, Owen Hewlett and to Giancarlo Rascio with the Gold Standard. Yeah. Hi, everyone. And thanks for having us on today. I'm Owen Hewlett of the Gold Standard and my colleague uh, Giancarlo Rascio joins me as well. Um, we're going to talk today about quantifying and certifying the SDG impacts, um, some of which we've spoken about in the last uh, presentation. So I'm going to take first a little bit to explain who we are, and what we do and how we got uh, to be able to do uh, that certification and quantification work. And then I'll pass to Giancarlo uh, to talk in a little bit more detail on, on how we do that specifically uh, with some of the SDG impacts we focused on, specifically in this case, uh, gender impacts. Uh, slide, please. 
Um, so uh, just very briefly, gold standard uh, is a standards system uh, that is uh, there to specialize in the certification of uh, climate and sustainable development projects. Uh, so climate, so projects that have a climate mitigation benefit uh, and that contribute in our case to the sustainable development goals uh, summarized by our mission, climate security and sustainable development for all. Um, slide please. Uh, if you don't know us, uh, we've been uh, in existence since the early 2000s. We were founded by WWF, uh, actually initially as a reaction to the clean development mechanism. So specifically, um, WWF founded us to provide a quality label that added uh, what they saw as the missing elements uh, of CDM. Um, so specifically, the lack of stakeholder inclusivity. Uh, safeguards and consideration of sustainable development uh, and as Giancarlo will come on to later in the presentation you know that's still very much the core of what gold standard does we, you know we strongly believe that you you can't develop a, a, a credible um, a development project uh, without those aspects carefully considered um, since then we've we've grown um, from strength to strength we have uh, around 1400 projects on our registry portfolio maybe four to five hundred at any one time uh, going through um, some form of certification. Uh, we are, um, uh, since, since 2015, we've been on a, a kind of new strategic trajectory that came about with our new CEO, uh, Marion Vell. Uh, slide please, uh, which is focused, uh, which was kind of serendipitous, I suppose. It focused on the joint global agendas of um, the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals, which you know, frankly could have been written for our agenda. And so, um, you know, it was a case very much for us of being in the right place at the right time and having the right uh, background and qualifications. Um, I share this slide not to kind of drop names, but what really just wanted to highlight one of the aspects, uh, you know, along with those kind of focus areas that uh, really helps when you're trying to develop ways of quantifying sustainable development goal impacts, particularly those that are outside our our kind of historic core of, of, of climate mitigation. Uh, you really need um, uh, backers, partners and, and kind of endorsers that have uh, some, some credibility and some weight and some gravitas. So we worked in the last couple of years on water benefits methodologies, on health methodologies, and you'll hear in a minute about some, uh, some of our gender work. Uh, and it, you know, it's it's kind of um, it's kind of unthinkable or unimaginable how we could have done that without some of our uh, some of our partners and some of the experts those guys provided to give that the, the gravitas and credibility. Uh, slide, please. Um, so, what did we do uh, since uh, since August last year? We have operated under a new version of Gold Standard called Gold Standard for the Global Goals. Uh, that brings together the the various standards that we operated up to that point. So, the various energy, land use, and water standards under one standard, uh, which allows us to be a lot more efficient. But but probably more importantly, it allows us to move to this next generation space. Uh, and just to explain what I mean by that, it, it kind of focuses on maybe two or three key areas. Uh, the first is that we wanted to update those core sensibilities of safeguards, sustainable development and inclusivity to latest best practice. Uh, and you'll see some of that in our gender sensitivity work that Giancarlo will explain. Uh, we wanted to make it modular and flexible so that uh, uh, a project proponent could uh, kind of come in as a project and then build their certification pathway adding the quantification layers for different sdgs as they uh, as they see fit and as serves their their finance model or their their mission uh, and and lastly um you you really have to unify uh, under one header if you're going to credibly certify multiple impacts from the same project because uh, otherwise inevitably uh, if you focus on one just climate just water uh, then what you result in is um, you know compromise in their favor so it's very difficult to to be all things to all people if you're prioritizing carbon but then trying to add water for example as opposed to uh, being more kind of open-minded about which which impacts so in a nutshell i'd say the third big area is it allows us to consider trade-offs as we go forward i suppose uh, and make reasoned development decisions um, so for us all projects have to contribute to three sustainable development goals so one of those can be sdg 13 uh, for climate mitigation and the other two or more are entirely up to the proponent and it's up to the proponent what they do with that information as well so a uh, slide please some of the applications uh, of the um, of the certification pathways just to briefly highlight them here uh, working left to right so uh, we'll still maintain our presence in environmental markets and, and 
um, you know, very much strongly grounded and continue to focus on the carbon markets specifically. Uh, but you know, it's very possible to use our quantification and certification outcomes uh, in environmental markets. And we've seen that uh, more recently with our focus on, uh, on the renewable energy certificate marketplace too. Uh, an area we're really excited about there is results-based finance. So uh, things like impact investment, fund certification, um, uh, philanthropic. So how can somebody use uh, outcome-based quantification and certification to support um, uh, results-based finance? That's something that's very much uh, on our agenda and, it, and it, it very much suits some of the SDG areas perhaps better than trying to kind of force fit them into an environmental market or a commodity like carbon credits. Um, we're also working heavily in the uh, corporate reporting space. How could uh, the gold standard um, quantification approach to climate and the SDGs be used in uh, corporate reporting under GHG protocol, for example. So how can you incorporate uh, projects and programs in your supply chain into corporate reporting? That will be a new certification pathway uh, that opens up this year. Um, so, so rather than being you know, forced, I suppose, to take carbon credits, there'll be a new approach available to corporates that works better with their corporate reporting climate. Uh, and then lastly, um, developing out uh, use of the standard for um, uh, things like uh, fund certification. So how could um, uh, an investment fund certify all the projects within all the investments within its fund and hence be a certified fund itself, or maybe uh, sustainable urban development, so large scale city programs for municipal authorities uh, and landscape, um, uh, landscape approaches as well. So uh, you can see some of those on our website. Uh, we did actually, and this might be interesting to, to some of the, the attendees, we did some market research on co-benefits um, specifically uh, for cook stove projects as it happens, but there's some interesting learnings in there that I think uh, are cross applicable to, uh, to land use projects as well. Uh, and certainly some of the feedback we've got is, is compelling and interesting. Uh, maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A um, slide, please. Uh, so really that's that's kind of it from my side. I wanted to give a brief overview of how we got to uh, gold standard for the global goals and broadly what it does. If you want to learn more specifically, then uh, we have a YouTube channel. Um, if you search for gold standard, uh, probably gold standard carbon actually would, would find it quicker. Uh, you can see some of our previous webinars and presentations if you want to learn more about the structure of the standard. Uh, but I'll pass to, to Giancarlo, who's going to explain a little bit more uh, about the sustainable development aspects uh, and the SDG contribution quantification and certification thanks thank you Owen good morning everyone uh, my name is Giancarlo I'm senior land use manager at gold standard and I will present a bit more in detail how the SDG quantification and certification works within our new version of the standard uh, putting special emphasis on the gender equality guidelines that we just launched in January this year so as Owen mentioned uh, gold standard has been always embedded with sustainable development into the core of of its standard uh, well long before the SDGs came around uh, with this new version of the standard uh, we're taking a step further uh, both uh, the process level and the design level and the performance level we want to measure impacts um, well this is important because at the project design level we can de-risk projects and provide credibility to make performance claims. Um, so this new version of the standard requires that projects must uh, deliver impact to at least three different SDG targets. One of these being, of course, SDG 13 climate action. Uh, these SDG positive impacts are, of course, rigorously quantified, uh, third party verified, and finally certified by uh, gold standard. Um, well, we know forestry, forest carbon projects be beyond um, decreasing carbon emissions or increasing carbon sequestration um, generate other benefits, which are known as co-benefits. Um, so far, the concern by market participants has been how to measure, or I mean, how to implement, measure, verify, and then communicate this these benefits and that's what uh, gold standard for the global goals um, allows to forest carbon projects to 
benefit from embedding these industry leading social and environmental safeguards into their design, helping the risk in the project, um, link, linking these uh, forest carbon projects to SDG reporting tools and SDG quantification tools that, of course, could develop in the future. And most importantly, to make this project more attractive to investors that are aiming to invest in a particular, particular SDG result. So with SDG certification, forest carbon projects could access new funding models. For, for example, um, results based finance, impact investment, or for example, in the particular case of gender equality, having gender equality certification as a premium that is um, embedded with the, the price of, of carbon units. Slide, please. And just to give you an example on um, with our sustainable sugar cane initiative, what we aim is to create value. So for example, here, if an investment is made with $5,000, let's say 500 credits at $10 per carbon credit, a project is also generated uh, positive impacts on SDG 8 decent work by the distribution and installation of filters. It's also generating positive impacts on SDG 3 good health by reducing waterborne diseases. And finally, it's also, of course, creating uh, benefits in climate action by mitigating uh, greenhouse gas. And the overall value created by this project will be around $59,000. So this is just an example to show how an investment that usually goes on the carbon side of a forestry or land use based project can actually generate more value. And the gold standard for the global goals helps projects to quantify, verify, and then demonstrate that these positive impacts actually took place. Slides, please. Now to talk about uh, our gender equality guidelines. So, Gold standard for the global goal has already a gender policy that has to be followed by all projects. Uh, we also have in place gender safeguards that are, I mean, has to be complied by all projects at the design level. And by doing this, all projects uh, can be labeled gender sensitive. But with these gender equality guidelines, projects can go a step further and certify the SDG impacts on SDG 5 by conducting best practices that mainstream gender within the climate security projects. Next slide, please. So just to, to give um, an overview of the, the, the terminology used here. So all projects under gold standard for the global goal that follow the gender policy and this um, gender safeguarding principles would be labeled as gender sensitive meaning that these projects uh, raise awareness on gender norms, roles, relations, but not necessarily address inequality by unequal norms that are affecting women. Those projects that follow the gender equality guidelines and wishes to go a step forward can um, certify positive impacts by including considerations and actions towards I mean, or to address unequal norms, relations beyond just creating gender awareness. Uh, slide, please. So the gender equality guidelines contain a total of six steps. Steps one to three, those uh, are mandatory for all projects because that uh, labels projects as gender sensitive, which I just explained, and then the steps uh, four through six, those are the additional steps that a project can follow to become certified as gender responsive. So uh, step one is pretty much um, to follow gender sensitive design and implementation according to gold standard for the global goal gender policy. Then a project will uh, do research, background research on gender and will align the project to any existing national policies, strategies, and also would have to include lesson lear lessons learned from other initiatives in the country. Um, step two would be to apply, of course, the gold standard for the global goal safeguarding principles. And step three would be to conduct a stakeholder consultation. 
following the gold standard for the global goal, stakeholder consultation, and engagement procedure requirements. So at that stage, all projects um, I mean, are following those uh, requirements and will be certified as um, gender sensitive. The additional three steps that are four to six leading to gender responsive certification aim towards creating a baseline, again, against which projects can demonstrate um, how they are going beyond being gender sensitive and more towards being gender responsive. So under these uh, three steps, project will have to be able to quantify, document, and also demonstrate, of course, gender claims in support of a strong business case. Um, so the minimum requirements to become gender responsive under our guideline would be um, to collect and use sex disaggregated data and qualitative information, of course, to analyze and then track any gender issues. Uh, the second step would be to conduct a gender analysis where the project examines what are the different situations in the project area for men and women and what impacts could the project have on different groups. And the final step would be uh, for the project to identify indicators and measurement units and to conduct monitoring that respond to gender responsive targets and for the indicators and then report on those. So that would be pretty much in a nutshell what the gender equality guidelines are, are providing in addition to what is already stated in the gender policy of Gold Standard for the Global Goals. So in summary, the gender equality guideline give an easy to understand stepwise process, I would say, for users to plan and then implement uh, climate projects with the aim of mainstreaming gender. Um, so the idea is that by using these guidelines, developer can quantify and then certify the gender impacts the projects are generating, which in turn will help them to access additional funding from well, an increasing pool of uh, gender lens investors. Next slide, please. Well, that will be it from our side. And um, well, I'm sure um, we will have questions that we could answer during the Q&A session, and then I'll leave the floor to the next panelist. Great, thank, thank you, you uh, Giancarlo and Owen. And with that, I'll pass it off to Ben Henneke with the International Small Group Tree Planting Program. Well, thank you, Melissa. And I recognize that we are running uh, late on time. So I'd like to just start off by saying that uh, the things you've seen in the previous two presentations, the importance of the kind of detailed work on the ground and the kind of impacts it can have, and then measuring them against the SDGs is very important. And then as uh, what, what the, the gold standard is doing in beginning to integrate those into their, into their evaluations and their certifications, all of this is really important work that's being done. I want to talk about something slightly different in, and do it from kind of a, a higher level, and I'm going to do it very fast. So I apologize to anyone who, who uh, thinks that they need more. Perhaps we'll have time for questions and we can ask them. Cleaner Action, uh, and President of Cleaner Action, had founded with 76 subsistence farmers in Tanzania uh, this goal to try to give them cash them to plant trees, improve their land, reduce CO2 in the air. TIST is now over 85,000 farmers and 16 million live trees. And they're quantified now in four countries, proving that it is replicable and it's scalable. I'm embarrassed that we are not part of ecosystem marketplaces information base, because if we were, you would have had many tens of thousands more uh, people involved. Uh, TIST encourages the farmers to meet together to discuss how to improve their lives and encourage them to go and do. Cleaner Action developed and discovered ways to measure the results of what the farmers choose to go and do. And that part of it is what relates to both of these previous uh, discussions. 
TIST is voluntary, and so each farmer decides if he or she wants to join and what actions they will take on their own land. The farmers meet together in seminars and cluster meetings and small groups to share ideas and to figure out what they want to do to improve their lives. In the 18 years we've been operating, the carbon business has provided an incentive for the farmers to take action and provided some of the funds for project development operations. But since very early in the project, the farmers started getting more benefits from the new farming practices and other things they developed than the cash prepayments they were getting from the carbon. And over time, their approaches to sustainability have started creating measurable, measurable results in what we now call the SDGs. In fact, at this point, it looks like uh, 16 or maybe even all 17 uh, have been impacted by the actions of some of the TISP farmers. So today, the value of the benefits to the farmers is over 10 times as much as the cost to plant the trees and 20 times what the carbon prepayments have been so far. To accomplish this, TIST women and men develop leadership abilities so that the program growth is organic and spreads from farmer to farmer. Now, I'm gonna show you some slides quickly and we may have a technical difficulty on one. We'll see if we can make it work. The next slide, please. This is why TIST started. The land behind this man was all dense forest a century ago, but cutting down the trees to use the land for farming started a process of land destruction. The wind and rain and plowing eroded the fragile forest topsoil. It's now nearly desert. Next slide, please. But people can reverse that situation. Trees bring back grass and bees and more water for maize crops. Next slide. And the, then you end up with fruits like pawpaw and avocado. Next slide. Some farmers end up using growing seedlings as a way to earn cash as well as to plant trees. Next slide. And some end up using sustainable development to survive droughts and actually have uh, improving their soil. Next slide. Others find that the trees provide them in this particular lady's case, she's, she's quite badly disabled and she ends up with free wood and, and food. Next slide. And this is the one we'll see if it works. Uh, not, doesn't look like it's working, so we're gonna go to our website and you'll have to do lots of clicking, Melissa, down there in the corner. All right, I'm ready. Each, go for it, just click as fast as your finger will go. So each yellow dot that you see there is the another tree grove of another TIST small group member. And what you see is that these have been quantified by highly trained local TIST participants and the number of trees, their size, their species is captured and it's publicly available on this website. Again, to click next slide. Now we are, well, it's next, next, uh, yes, thank you. Click again. This is one man in Chennai started out trying to start TIST in, in southern India. And every country is different, different, but what remains is this spread of TIST from one successful farmer to members of their family, to friends, to neighbors, and then the public availability of all the data. Next slide. Now, yeah, you have to skip those slides since they didn't work. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Of course it was working yesterday. There we go. So we've had 27 successful third-party verifications under Climate Community Biodiversity Alliance, which was another, like uh, Plan Vivo and like the gold standard, a way to start capturing the benefits to biodiversity, to the communities, et cetera, in addition to the carbon. And then over 2 million tons of carbon uh, on the, uh, for CO2 credits. We're doing now SDG monitoring as well. Next slide, please. Our customers have won lots of sustainability awards. TIST has won awards, been voted best offsetting project, et cetera. 
But the real key here is those local leaders have kept our costs low and our results have kept increasing. What you see on this chart is as the trees mature, the benefits increase rapidly. And our cost per tree or our cost per hectare has been declining as we learned and the farmers learned more and more best practices. When the farmers get the 70% of the carbon profits, their benefits will rise and their income will rise also. Next slide. However, this is really the challenge for all of us who are here on this uh, webinar. WRI did this work with uh, IUCN and so on. There are five billion acres of degraded land that humans have degraded over the last 150 years. That we did this damage is short-sighted and heartbreaking, but it now represents an enormous opportunity to reforest and for the communities to create value for themselves and for the planet. The results of doing reforestation, doing red projects where they're appropriate, doing this kind of reforestation among small farmers, doing large reforestation projects where they can be done, the results could be stunning. If just 20% of this land, a billion acres, were to achieve the same measured results that TIST has achieved to date, it would offset eight gigatons of CO2 per year. That's more CO2 than the USA emits in a year. There is enormous opportunity here, and farmers are eager to improve their lives. The approach and the technology are proven, the benefits to communities and to the planet are enormous. I encourage all of us on this uh, webinar to start realizing that it's time to get moving. It's time to go and do. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, and thanks to all of our panelists. I think this has been a great uh, conversation. And I know that we are just past the top of the hour right now. But um, if our panelists don't mind sticking around for another five or 10 minutes, um, we do have a couple of questions from the audience. So it'd be great to get to those. Um, for anyone that does need to leave, we're going to be, um, as I said, we're, we're recording this presentation and it'll be online. Also, if you do um, type a question into the question box and we can't get to it or we can't get to it before you uh, leave, then we'll do our best to follow up via email. And uh, hi, everyone. My name is Kelly Hamrick. I'm the other author of the State of the Forest Carbon Finance Report, and I will be moderating questions. Um, so I'm going to start with the first one, uh, which is that uh, social co-benefits can sometimes be subjective. And so the questioner was asking if any of the panelists have faced criticism uh, that their claimed benefits are not, in fact, benefits that have happened on the ground, um, or are there are situations where you know actions were taken to try and uh, create co-benefits, but the project area actually did not improve. Um, so how did you deal with that criticism if, if you've experienced that? Well, Kelly, this has been, you know, everybody gets criticized about something. I don't know anyone who doesn't find it. If nothing else, your mother always found something wrong with you. Um, but we haven't had much of that problem. The difficulty for us is that because it is so driven by the individual farmers, some farmers do a particular project that works well. We pass that word along through the network to these tens of thousands of farmers in all these countries. They may or may not pick it up. That's the, that's the challenge that we face on it. And Kelly, it's, it's Owen from Gold Standard. So I, I completely echo what Ben just said. So two other quick observations. So one for me is the, the kind of, particularly in the context of environmental finance is the critical need for a robust verification, um, you know, self self reporting, you know, can serve a purpose, but you know, it, it really damages credibility. I think if the the verification and certification of impacts isn't done well, and then on the methodological side, you know, we got quite philosophical writing some of ours about whether you know are we talking about impacts or outcomes or outputs or activities, and the the truth is, there's a whole world of those things, and, and you know, one experience we wrote. The health methodology for for improved cooking and the measure there is um, avoided disability adjusted life years. So it's basically a, a measure of mortality and morbidity. 
But of course, the reality is that that's a thing that unfolds over a long period of time, and, and the methodology is based on a very, a very, very credible scientific model. Uh, but, but of course, if you went to site, you wouldn't see less people dying per se. That, that doesn't make any sense. But the the the, the impact is is still real and credible and important, uh, um, and has a great story to tell, and, and a much more interesting story to tell, perhaps than than measuring only reductions in particulate matter in that case. So, so I think it's, it's a real balancing act, I think, about, about what you're measuring and what you're talking about and how you present it. Um, and and you know, I think a lot of it comes down to transpa transparency and credibility uh, of how you wrote it. Uh, this is Elena. Uh, I agree with the other two panelists. Uh, this is demanding from us, from all the project developers, to have a more scientific approach on how we are measuring uh, our, our co-benefits. It's um, easy to say something that you, say, you see in the ground, but you also have to um, engage with other methodologies. And we, and in this case, for example, for SDGs, uh, all around the world, we're trying to find a good way how to measure and how to do accountability on how the impacts of the projects or, uh, or, or anything that you are developing is really um, having a way to measure. So I, I, I believe that uh, we are going to see a more scientific base uh, approach on how we are measuring uh, the impact of all the projects. Hey, thank you so much, all. Um, there's another question that sort of, I think, builds off of this one. I'm actually going to combine two questions, but it kind of goes on the fact that, you know, you can, you can quantify these co-benefits, but then in terms of trying to quantify the value added, um, and in terms of who actually pays for that, I mean, how does how does the financing side of this work? Do, do people actually pay more for the co-benefits? Um, you know, how when you're actually trying to put a price on what's what's the price of someone who's like less sick? You know, what's what's the thought process that goes behind all of that? Yeah, yeah, Kelly. So, oh, and again from Gold Standard, I, I, like I said, there's a there's an interesting report on our website which is which is worth a look. I'm happy to to share the link if it's helpful, but. Um, so a couple of a quick observations on that is that um, the the kind of main buyers of co-benefits or funders of co-benefits will either be impact investors through results-based finance or a premium added to another environmental commodity like a carbon credit. So, and that premium could be in the form of access to a buyer uh, who wouldn't otherwise buy, or it could be uh, through an increased price premium. That that's the the very very quick whistle stop tour of the the market research we did under Cook Stoves, but I think it's interesting and, and, and certainly worth a look. Um, the the other thing that um, that we're working on that I think will help this actually, uh, but is 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 going to be quite a hard piece of work. But I think it will help this discussion is a is a shared value calculation for some of those uh, co benefits. So actually being able to put a dollar value to um, some of the co-benefits to help with communication and help with pricing. So so let alone whether somebody would pay a premium for something some people are willing to pay for it but have no idea what the value should be like how do you even start to put the value on a on an a daily for example in health or biodiversity um so we're working on a shared value calculator that puts the kind of you know the social value of carbon if you like uh, we did again not to sorry keep plugging my website here but um we did an, an earlier pilot version of that which is which again is, is on the kind of newsroom where um we commissioned a study into the the value uh, on um, uh, you know the, the the shared value of different carbon credit options, um, and and what we'd like to do is create that as a model that can be rolled out um, you know for project proponents to use. Yep. Well, and I guess Kelly, I, this is Ben. I would I would suggest that the when you look at that map of the world, the opportunities here are for lots of people to do it for lots of different reasons. Uh, that even if what happens is that all forestry projects, which we know it's almost impossible for a good forestry project not to bring lots of co-benefits, if forestry projects just started finally being paid attention to based on how much impact they can have for climate change and for people, that'd be fabulous. And if we get more sophisticated and start being able to have people take dollar equivalent benefits into account and so on, that'd be terrific. But Let's just get going. Uh, 
Well, from our experience, um, that also depends on the purpose of the buyer. Uh, some of them, for example, are interested in one example for us is coffee. So they add uh, more value to all the activities that you're doing in that topic in specific. Uh, but some of them are only looking uh, for uh, buy-in, as you said in, in, in the beginning, um, well, for a good price or for other purposes. But I believe as much as we can report of uh, all this value that we are giving to the forest and all these services that the forests are giving us, uh i think that we are going to create a better uh, approach on how to uh see this market uh to see it as a very valuable um uh, thing to to buy and to support and that you are uh growing um a lot of benefits in the ground for the people and for the biodiversity I believe that we can create that conscience and in in the market. Thank you all. And um, oh, and I think we can I, I think add a link to that report when we send up the email sort of thanking people for attending this webinar. So if people are interested in that, we can definitely share it. Um, I know we are sort of running over time, so I think I'm going to wrap up with just one more question. Um, as a reminder, we will get to those that we haven't answered uh, via email. But I, I want to end with a question. Um, what is the biggest challenge to attracting funding for your projects? And then I sort of, sort of want to add my own question to that as well, which is, you know, what's the biggest challenge as well to scaling up um, your projects? You know, Ben, you had a really great slide showing what the potential opportunity is, but how do we get there? Um, so anyway, let, let me know what your thoughts are. Yeah, and Kelly, I, I would suggest that, in fact, there's been a real, uh, uh, lack of information about the impacts of forestry. And so we really have a situation where uh, when the, the calculations have been done by the UNFCC about climate change, they have underestimated the benefits of, of uh, forestry on the amount of carbon that gets sequestered. Uh, they're, they're one third to one eighth of the actual measured results that we're getting. And I'm not saying every place is gonna get as good results as we got, that's not the point. But forestry is the best shot we have as a human race to get enough carbon taken back out of the atmosphere to avoid some of the worst impacts of climate change. There isn't a number two technology out there that can move as fast, get as much done, and oh, by the way, it has these many multiples, uh, essentially improvements in each of the countries. Uh, national income accounting, their gross national product, is improved by these forestry projects. That word is not out. And I think first you have to end up with people getting it, understanding it, and then uh, producing the kind of resources that are necessary in people, in leaders, and in projects. Kelly, sorry, I was on mute. I just realised the old mute trick. Um, so, so just on the on the scaling up side, I think you know again, I come at a slightly different angle from uh, from from the colleagues on the panel here. But um, I think what we see is that you know a lot of change happens through the the initiation or investment in projects. Uh, and what we're finding is projects aren't well embedded in things like corporate reporting or even national reporting, where you know policy, for example, is more important. Um, so we're kind of breaking down those barriers um, on how to use the data and approach from projects in other fields. And I think that'll make it more accessible to, to more funders. Uh, and then the second, I think, is to try and learn the lessons of project infrastructure around things like verification and certification. So obviously looking at how we can make methodologies more practical uh, without losing the rigor, uh, but also how we can make things like the audit process, which, you know, in the CDM world is pretty archaic now. How can we make that smarter and more efficient and quicker uh, so that proponents can access it more easily and can gear up more easily uh, and funders aren't put off by, you know, investing in projects that have kind of a, a you know, a crazy proportion of which goes to, um, you know, pr proving that it was real. Um, uh, yeah, how can we improve those two areas? I agree with Ben with the approach that he said uh, before. 
the best investment that you can have is a forest is the best way to uh, mitigate uh, climate change but i also believe that uh, we also have to work in uh, carbon price uh, we have a whole different uh, angle of the prices uh, between different countries and different standards and different uh, ways of, of working but the thing is that uh, we need a more competitive uh, carbon price and that's something that has been talked uh, all around the world after the Paris Agreement. I, I believe that's something that we will have to work for having um, uh, a fair price to the carbon will be a good way to have an improvement in the future. Great, thank you all so much. Or, sorry, Ben, do you want to say one last word? Well, no, I just completely agree with what the others two, not surprisingly, with what the others two said. But uh, TIST is already uh, fully financed by the carbon, even at these crummy prices. Uh, I think you're right. You get the prices up higher, then lots of capital will flow to it because it gives very high returns then. But even so, people don't yet know that forestry is the best solution we have in the short run to build a bridge for some of these other wonderful technologies to get developed, get, get piloted, and get deployed. And there's not another choice, and we, but we aren't telling our story well enough. Great. Well, with those final insights, um, I'm going to put an end to the webinar, but um, I did want to remind everyone we will follow up with any questions we have not answered yet. Um, and also just once again, thank you all for participating, especially to our panelists. Uh, I know I certainly was learning a lot about um, what's going on at, both at the project level, but also at the standard level. It's a pretty exciting time, I think. Um, so I'm hoping that everyone else similarly got a lot out of this. Uh, and we'll follow up shortly with uh, the links to the webinar and, um, and hope that you all keep in touch with us. So thank you once again. Thank you, Melissa and Kelly. Appreciate it. And uh, they keep good reports coming. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to all. Bye -bye.